This is Einstein's equation of mass-energy equivalence. Energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. Even if you don't know what this equation means or where it comes from, it's very likely that you've seen this equation. In fact, pretty much any list of the most famous or most important equations of all time include this equation, usually describing it as some variant of the most famous equation of all time. And there are countless pop culture references to this equation. Even here, on this shirt of my wife's, with loads of mathematical and physical equations, there it is, e equals mc squared, right, front, and center. But why this equation? Out of all of the physical and mathematical equations out there, why is this the one that's so pervasive in our modern day culture? Now, of course, this is a question that I want to try to answer in this video, but before we get to the bottom of it, we should probably clarify what the equation means and where it comes from first. And in doing so, we'll actually see that this isn't the full equation, but instead a special case of it. In practice, there are several different ways to derive this famous equation, but perhaps the most efficient, though not the original method, is by invoking Noether's theorem. I've talked about this theorem a couple times in the past on this channel, but to quickly recap, this theorem tells us that for every mathematical symmetry of our theory, there is a corresponding physical conserved quantity. The two most important for this discussion are symmetries under moving in any direction in space, also known as spatial translations, or by shifting forward and backwards in time, or time translations. If we use Noether's theorem, we find that the conserved quantities corresponding to spatial and time translations are linear momentum and energy, respectively. Now, when we upgrade our picture of nature to use the framework of special relativity developed by Einstein in the early 1900s, we find that space and time are not really separate entities. By transforming from one reference frame to another, we mix together space and time in a way described by the Lorentz transformations. We can describe such transformations as acting on a so-called four-position vector, which is essentially just the standard three-dimensional position vector, but with an additional zero component, which describes the particle's position in time. Notice the extra factor of the speed of light in this zero component, which is essentially just acting as a conversion factor so that the units work out properly. However, these Lorentz transformations share many similarities with rotations, one being that they don't only act on position vectors, but in fact any four vectors in the spacetime. We'll come back to this point in just a second. Putting this together, we see that we no longer need to separate spatial and time translations into two different things. They're simply combined spacetime translations, which act on our full spacetime position four vector. The result of symmetries under such translations is a conserved four momentum, where the time component corresponds to the energy, divided by the speed of light for units, and the spatial component is just the standard three momentum. We're not quite there, we still need to find an expression for this four momentum in order to solve for the energy. We may be tempted to just take a time derivative of our space-time position and multiply by mass like we do in Newtonian mechanics, but we need to be very careful here. In Newtonian mechanics, the definition of time was the same for all observers, but when using special relativity, time and space rotate into each other when relating reference frames. So looking at a change in time in one frame is the same at looking at some combination of a change in space and a change in time in another frame. So instead, we need to use a time that all observers can agree on. As it turns out, really the only choice that makes sense is the amount of time that elapses in the rest frame of the particle itself instead of any one observer. This is typically called proper time and denoted with a tau instead of a t. So we can find the proper four velocity of a particle by considering its evolution in its rest frame, where it will have a fixed spatial position and simply be evolving at a rate the speed of light times tau through its proper time. Taking a derivative with respect to this proper time, we find that the particle is simply moving through time with a temporal velocity c.
Now, to get to any other reference frame, we simply need to perform a Lorentz transformation, or really an inverse Lorentz transformation in this case. Note that this is not the same as the true velocity that this observer measures. They'll see the particle simply traveling at a velocity v. This is instead a frame-invariant way of talking about the motion of the particle through space-time. And since we want to make a general statement about conserved quantities regardless of the reference frame, this proper velocity is the thing we want to use. We can finally get our four momentum by simply multiplying this by the mass of the particle to get this expression here. It should be noted that you will sometimes see this expression written in terms of the so-called relativistic mass, where the factor of gamma is absorbed into the definition of the mass of the particle. While this gives the four momentum the same form as we would see in Newtonian mechanics, I personally find it a bit confusing to talk about two different masses, one of which is frame-dependent, so instead, whenever I refer to the mass, I will always be talking about the honest-to-goodness rest mass of the particle, or the mass that would be measured in the frame where the particle isn't moving. So we see that the energy of a particle in any frame is given by E equals gamma mc squared. This is fine, but often it's more useful to write this equation in terms of the spatial momentum, which we can find by solving the spatial part of the equality for the magnitude of the spatial velocity, which allows us to replace the gamma factor in terms of the three momentum and the mass. We can then plug this into what we found before for the zero component of the four momentum, and we find this expression for the energy. Of course, in the rest frame of the particle, where its three momentum vanishes, this reduces to the famous equation E equals mc squared. Okay, so now that we've seen how the equation is derived, we can talk more about the implications of the equation and what it actually tells us. The first thing that we can notice is that we can simply set the mass of the particle to zero to get a non-zero energy assuming that the momentum of the particle doesn't vanish. But is this even a reasonable assumption to make? In classical mechanics, if we take the mass of a particle to zero, its momentum, and therefore its energy, also vanish. But remember that the relativistic version of the momentum includes an extra factor of gamma. The interesting thing to note is that if we take m to zero, as well as the inverse of gamma to zero at the same time, we can get a finite non-zero result. Now, the way we do this isn't unique, and we can really get any answer between minus infinity and plus infinity in any direction. But this is exactly the range of values we always expect of the momentum. So this tells us that we can have a physical, massless particle, which carries some non-zero amount of energy and momentum, as long as it travels at the speed of light. Going back to the case of massive particles, perhaps the most profound thing that we learn from this equation is that the rest mass of a particle is simply another form of energy, to be treated on equal footing with the kinetic energy associated with the movement of the particle. This means that it's feasibly possible to convert mass into kinetic energy and vice versa. Note that this is in stark contrast with the classical case where mass is a conserved quantity. It can never be created nor destroyed. Interestingly, we can actually prove this with our relativistic equation of energy. We'll consider the case of 2 to 2 scattering, where we start with two particles of mass m1 and m2 with momenta p1 and p2, which collide and produce two new particles with masses m3 and m4 and momenta p3 and p4. Starting with our relativistic version of conservation of energy for this reaction, we'll consider the non-relativistic limit where the kinetic energy due to the particles having non-zero momentum is much smaller than the energy due to the rest mass of that particle. In this case, we can expand each one of the square roots to find this equation. The second terms on each side are subleading, suppressed by additional factors of the velocity of the particles divided by the speed of light in comparison to the first terms, and give the standard classical expression for the conservation of kinetic energy for free particles. 
However, the leading term actually tells us that the sum of masses of the initial state particles are equal to the sum of masses of the final state particles. Non-relativistic interactions should conserve mass. Notice that we got this fact purely by considering our relativistic kinematics, whereas in Newtonian kinematics, conservation of mass is taken as an assumption, though it can be shown in other contexts such as the continuity equation of fluid mechanics. The fact that mass is just another form of energy actually has some really interesting consequences. First of all, it tells us that very heavy particles can actually be produced from lighter ones as long as we collide those light particles at high energies. And this is exactly what's done at places like the Large Hadron Collider or SLAC, where they take particles like protons or electrons and positrons, collide them at high energies to produce very heavy particles like the Higgs boson or the top quark. Additionally, it tells us that we can go the other way, where we start with a very heavy particle sitting still in its rest frame, and as long as the interactions of nature allow it, this particle can decay into lighter particles with high kinetic energies. Now, another thing that we can notice about the equation, specifically in the rest frame, is that the rest mass energy of a particle comes with a factor of the speed of light squared in its contribution to the energy. Although this is simply a conversion factor, it is a huge conversion factor. This means that a lot of energy is actually stored in mass. At the end of the day, this conversion actually ends up being a large factor into the fame of this equation, as I'll we'll talk about in a little bit. So now that we understand how to get the equation and what it means, we can finally really ask the question of why it's so famous. Now, I really want to preface this with the fact that this isn't a strictly objective discussion. It's a societal question that has many, many different answers. So I want to present what I see as the biggest factors which contribute to the fame of this equation, and when combined, really seem to be reasons why it captured the public attention so much. To understand this to some extent, we have to look a bit at history. Now, the century leading up to Einstein's original paper on special relativity in 1905 saw unprecedented technological advancement. The Industrial Revolution and the decades that followed completely changed the way society functioned through inventions such as the steam engine, mechanical production of goods, and electrical grids. Of course, these inventions were built off of the scientific principles of thermodynamics and electrodynamics, which were discovered in the 18th and 19th centuries giving the public a front and center view of the rapid and dramatic impact that applications of scientific principles could have. Now with this in mind, it's not really a surprise that science fiction exploded in popularity with authors like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells capturing people's imaginations with extrapolations of where the type of scientific advancements that led to the Industrial Revolution could go in the future. Additionally, other scientific communication publications like Scientific American and Popular Science also emerged in the mid-19th century as well. In short, people had seen firsthand what scientific advancement meant for society and seemed to be fascinated by imagining the implications for the future of humanity and learning about the current progress in a variety of fields. Around the turn of the 20th century, our understanding of physics was dramatically changing as well. The propagation of light in a vacuum and divergences in the energy of certain electromagnetic systems, also known as the ultraviolet catastrophe, showed that something was amiss in the understanding of electromagnetism at the time. These problems were resolved by Planck's postulate in 1900 that electromagnetic energy always comes in discrete pieces, and Einstein's assertion in 1905 that the speed of light in the vacuum is constant for all observers giving rise to quantum mechanics and special relativity, respectively. Of course, these theories dramatically changed the way that we view our world, 
quantum mechanics leads to things like quantum entanglement and quantum tunneling, whereas special relativity gives us time dilation and mass energy equivalents. With this paradigm shift in science, along with the growing public interest in fundamental science, it isn't that big of a surprise that ideas from this period became quite popular. However, there were many, many groundbreaking equations that came from this period, so why did the mass-energy equivalence equation win out over these others as the popular science equation? I think that one of the main reasons that this equation became so popular is that it's remarkably simple. There's just three letters and a square. But it's still a key result coming from this time period where our entire perception of the world was changing. But this still can't fully explain it. In fact, there are many relatively simple equations that appeared around this time, including Planck's postulate itself, saying that the energy corresponding to any one frequency of the electromagnetic field must come in an integer number of units, or in other words, light comes in discrete chunks known as photons. So there must be something more to E equals mc squared, otherwise other simple equations of this time would be just as popular today. I think that to address this further, we not only need to think about the popularity of the equation itself, but the popularity of the man behind the equation. Now, as it turns out, Einstein was a huge driver in all of these changes happening to physics. In just 1905, known as his Annus Mirabilis, or Miracle Year, he published four incredible papers. One showing that special relativity solves the issue of light propagating in a vacuum, one introducing the idea of mass-energy equivalence, one on Brownian motion, which gave critical insight into the particle-like nature of matter, as well as topics in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, and finally, the photoelectric effect, which was a method of applying and testing Planck's postulate of a quantized electric field for which he won the Nobel Prize in Physics. Just 10 years later, in 1915, Einstein published his first work on general relativity, which revolutionized the way we understood gravity. With all of this field-altering work, as well as the aforementioned popularity of science at the time, Einstein became quite a celebrity, and this still carries over to today. His name has become synonymous with genius. But I think that Einstein's fame, along with the simplicity of the equation itself, doesn't explain why the mass-energy equivalence became so popular. In fact, each one of these topics of Einstein's has a fundamental equation that is comparably simple to E equals mc squared. Even the original Einstein field equations of general relativity, without the cosmological constant, look quite simple on their surface, even if there's a lot buried beneath the notation. To get to the bottom of this, we need to first discuss a simple fact that annoys many high school chemistry students every year. If one compares the mass of an atom to the sum of masses of all of its protons, neutrons, and electrons, you don't get the same answer. In fact, after the discovery of the neutron in 1932 by James Chadwick, atomic and nuclear structure was studied in more depth, and they found this result. In this plot, I'm showing the ratio of the mass of atoms divided by the sum of the masses of the atom's components against the atomic number. There's a few things to notice here. First is that the ratio is universally less than 1. In other words, the atoms are always lighter than the sum of their components. This is just a statement that the protons, neutrons, and electrons making up the atoms prefer to be in these bound states if they get the chance. The other thing to notice is that this ratio isn't constant. The atoms get heavier per component on either side of iron. So what does this have to do with mass-energy equivalents? Well, as was realized around the mid to late 1930s, converting a heavy element into lighter ones, or converting light elements into a heavier one, would result in the end-state system being lighter than the initial state system. But we know from mass-energy equivalents that this mass doesn't just vanish into nowhere, but instead it has to be converted into energy, and a lot of energy at that. 
Of course, the impacts of this discovery would be devastating. Now, of course it isn't true to say that this one equation is the reason that atomic bombs exist. In fact, there had to be many, many steps taken and other discoveries made in order for the creation of these weapons to be possible. However, from a public perspective, when people wonder why a nuclear weapon is so much more devastating than a conventional bomb, the answer is simple. E equals mc squared. Now, at the end of the day, I think that all of these reasons together really contributed to the popularity of E equals mc squared, and made it arguably the most recognizable equation in history. Although Google's n-gram literature search isn't necessarily the most reliable source for subjects like this due to some inherent biases, I think that it can lend some credibility to the fact that it's only the combination of the factors that I've talked about that led to the grip of this one equation on the public. If we look at the English fiction corpus to eliminate scientific literature, we see that Einstein's name, as well as the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, appear decades earlier than E equals mc squared which only starts to show up around the end of the Second World War, when the nuclear bombs had already been developed. So Einstein and his theories, and the others that appeared from the scientific revolution of the early 20th century for that matter, were popular already long before the Manhattan Project, but the equation itself only gained popularity after the creation of nuclear weapons. Now, of course, as I said before, a sociological question like why is E equals mc squared so popular is a very difficult question to answer, so I don't want to give the impression that my explanation is the one objectively correct one. That said, I really do think that a perfect storm of the simplicity of the equation itself, the fame of the man who first brought it to light, and of course the fact that it provided the fundamentals necessary to create the most destructive weapons in all of history certainly were all huge factors in this one equation gaining so much popularity. I think that at the end of the day, whether or not you agree with what I've said here, we can all agree on the fact that this is easily one of the most recognizable equations in history, and it has fundamentally changed our world, for better or for worse. It follows from the special theory of relativity that mass and energy are both are but different manifestations of the same thing. A somewhat unfamiliar conception for the average mind. Furthermore, the equation E is equal to mc squared, in which energy is put equal to mass multiplied with the square of the velocity of light, showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy.